Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in to watch the recording of the second lecture on financial statement analysis. Please feel free to pause anytime if you need extra caffeine to stay awake or you have to go because of too much coffee. This week, the recommended rating is chapter 2. You can see I have put a difficulty level there with two full stars and two empty stars. Would you like to have a guess what they mean? Well, the idea is that, in my opinion, the material in this week would be impossible if you decided not to study the lecture note, not to attempt the tutorial questions, not to read more on Google, or not to read a textbook. In some weeks, you may be able to cram the last minutes before your exam. Week 2 is, however, not one of those. It would be impossible, so 2 out of 2 stars for difficulty. On the other hand, if you decide to give a go and study it sorrowfully using whatever materials available to you, then this week will be a piece of cake, difficulty zero. This is not a gimmick to lure you into reading the lecture notes. Trust me, it will be impossible if you leave this week until the last minute. We have five tutorial questions, which are included at the end of lecture note. There are currently two ongoing MLFL tests. Please pay attention to the due date. The first one due next Friday, 15th of March, and the second test due in three weeks time, 22nd of March. Learning objectives for this week. Note that in item one, we want you to list the four major financial statements and discuss what they are. To make your life a lot easier, we will focus on three of the four, balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flows. Item 2 talks about we would like you to discuss the difference between book value and market value of shareholders' equity, which are almost always different. In a few minutes' time, I will share Warren Buffett's view on this. The, task, the textbook covers lots of ratios. Our focus in this unit is to understand a few important ones. But remember, you don't have to memorize any formula for any ratio. In your mid semester exam, you'll be able to bring in a double-sided A4 size information sheet. You can put whatever on it, as long as it fits in the size requirement. That is, I don't think you need to memorize any formulas. It is a lot more important to understand the intuition behind them. To make your life easier again, some slides have highlighted headings. These are the ones that discuss important concepts which will be directly applied in the rest of the unit. The focus of this course is to think as a financial manager with a goal to maximize shareholders' wealth. But how do we do that? We need to know how to value financial assets as a way to figure out what would be the best way to raise additional funding to finance our investment decisions. And how to value real assets so we can do a proper capital budgeting before we decide which investment decision should we make. And we need to measure risk-adjusted return so that we are able to compare investments that are of different lengths of life. One risky investment takes three years, one less risky investment takes five years. How do we compare them? But before we can make optimal decisions, we need information. We need to understand how much money we currently have in the company, what do we owe to our suppliers, our profitability. This takes us to the topic of today, what can we learn from financial statements? Or really, how do we communicate with other financial market participants using the language of accounting? For those of you who have never dealt with accounting before, you may ask, why do we need to study accounting? Well, let me try to illustrate the importance using a simple example. Let's suppose you are inspired by the popularity of apples in our first lecture last week. You overheard from other students that they wish they could have apples in class 2 and so you decide to start an apple booth. And of course, you are hoping that one day your business can take off and become another course. Here we have three scenarios. Let's go through them one by one. Suppose on day one, you started your fruit booth with $1,000. You bought 100 kilograms of apples from your supplier for $200. You sold all 100 kilograms of apples for 400 bucks. You had no inventory left by the end of day one. If we summarize all transactions, it looks like you started with $1,000, went down to 800 due to the cost of inventory. It then went up to 
1200 because of the $400 revenue. In terms of your Apple inventory, you went from 0 to 100 kilograms and then down to 0. If someone asks you how's your business on day 1, you'll be pretty happy to report a $200 profit over here. Very straightforward. In our second scenario, suppose on day 2, you started your fruit booth with $1200. You bought 200 kilograms of apples from your supplier for $400. You hired, say, James as an assistant and pay him 50 bucks for the day. You only sold 100 kilograms of apples for $400. You had 100 kilograms of apples as your inventory left by the end of day two. On the right hand side, we can see that the cash count goes from 1200 to 800 down to 750 because the salary payment to James and then tops at 11.50. In terms of Apple inventory, we finished the day with 100 kilograms remaining. If you would like to calculate your profit for day 2, could that be a loss of $50? Well, perhaps not, because although you have less cash now, you still have 100 kilograms of apples, which surely can be sold for something, right? Now, let's move on to our final scenario Suppose on day 3, you started your fruit booth with 11.50 from the day before and 100 kilograms of apples from day 2. You bought 100 kilograms of apples from your supplier for $20. You paid 300 as the monthly rent for the booth. You hired James again for 50 bucks. You sold 100 kilograms of apples for $400. 20 kilograms of apples from day 2 went bad and couldn't be sold. So you had 80 kilograms of apples from day 3 as your inventory left by the end of day 3. All transactions are illustrated in terms of cash and apples here. If you want to find out your profit for day 3, could that be a loss of $150? Well, similar to day 2, you still have 80 kilograms of apples. On top of that, you have also prepaid a whole month of rent which means for the remaining 27 days, the rent cost won't be incurred again. From these three scenarios, even just to simply estimate the so-called profit, you can see that it is not as easy as it sounds like. We need rules to guide us what to do in situations like this, which pretty much happened everywhere, every day. We focus on three types of financial statements in this finance unit which are the balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flows. Here's a commonly asked question. Why do we study accounting in a finance unit? One simple answer is that it helps us to communicate with other market participants and makes a more informative financial decision. If you want to start investing, say, $5,000 in the share market, there are 20, 2,232 companies, that's right, 2,232 companies currently listed on the ASX, Australian Securities Exchange. Which ones should you invest? Large companies? Growth stocks? These two questions are not trivial. For example, when someone says they prefer to invest in a large company, they certainly wouldn't mean the building size of the company's headquarters. And when you see two investors talking about the term growth stocks, what do they refer to? From a financial manager's point of view, how could you communicate the success of your business to existing as well as potential investors so that you could attract more funding? A major way to do so is to learn from financial statements. Just to give you another example on why we should study accounting, it is important for a financial practitioner. Probably you have all heard about Warren Buffett, who has a net worth of around 82.9 billion US dollars, which is roughly a billion times more than what I currently have in my wallet. He is known for his value investing philosophy, and among many others, he is also known for his annual letter to shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway Incorporated. Highly recommended to read them if you can. The first one is his 2017 letter to shareholders that was sent on 24th of February 2018. I have got two parts that have been highlighted with red dashed lines. 
per share book value. Oh, sorry. Excuse me for the um the email alert. Anyway, let's go get back there. Um, the first one is that here we have got two parts that have been highlighted with red dash lines. The first one is the per share book value, and the second one is a large proportion of our gain did not come from anything we accomplished at Berkshire. So, why? What do you mean? Why do I highlight it? Well, this part will come again in the 2018 letter. Let's move on to the next next slide. So that he briefly explains this, the rationale in the next slide. The new rule says that a net change in unrealized investment gains and losses in stocks we hold must be included in all net income figures we report to you. So what's this new rule and what is this gap, GAP? Okay, let's move to his more recent 2018 letter to shareholders um, available on 25th of February 2019. Remember how the opening paragraph in his 2017 letter talked about per share book value? The first paragraph is not here anymore. And he started his second paragraph by emphasizing that the new gap rule, a new gap rule requires us to include that last item in the earnings. As I emphasized in 2017 in a report, Neither Berkshire's Vice Chair, Chairman Charlie Munger nor I believe that rule to be sensible. So, remember how he talked about the rule that and the new rule available in 2017? Now the effect kicks in, now he has to include this unrealized laws in the statement. And he explained in the next slide. Well, first of all, he, he, he talked about, for nearly three decades, the initial paragraph featured a percentage change in Berkshire's per share book value is abundant. Why? Because here he mentioned about this is a metric that has lost its relevancy once held. I'm not here to be pro or against what he does. I simply want to use this example to highlight that accounting has a set of rules to determine what to do and when to do. Even Warren Buffett struggles to find a better way to communicate his success to investors within these boundaries. The title of our second lecture is Financial Statements Analysis. So what are they? Financial statements are accounting reports issued periodically to present past performance and a snapshot of the firm's asset and financing of those assets. For a public listed company, you can easily find them on a company's website, let's say BHP. You go to BHP's website, which is here, and if you click Investor Center, and then click over there, and then you go to Shareholder Information, or Annual Reporting 2018. Doesn't matter which one you go, and here you can download the Annual Reports 2018, not all of these reports are required by the regulators, and what we are going to study together are the three main ones that need to be reported at a minimum as a listed company. As a listed company on ASX, you need to file financial results so that some key financial metrics are available to public, not just to existing shareholders. Naming convention here depends on the frequency. You can have a quarterly basis 4C, half yearly basis 4D, annual basis 4E. It is common to see important figures such as earnings on a half yearly basis. You, rem you may remember our example of sales 32 in week 1. January, February, March is the reporting season for half year report, and July, August, September is the typical report season for annual reports in Australia. If you are going to start your finance career as a stock analyst, you know you will be pretty busy around this time. On the other hand, if you work as an accountant or an auditor, your finance friend won't be able to find you in the months leading to the end of financial period. The four financial statements required by ASX are balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flows, statement of, cash, statement of shareholders' equity. We're going to be focusing on the first three. 
the advantages as an information source. Comparing the statements or reports that are not audited, these are more credible because they are subject to reg regulatory oversight. They provide a more true and fair view. In other words, a company cannot just describe their profitable activities and hide things that are at a loss. Well, theoretically speaking, they cannot. Their disadvantages as an information source are also quite apparent. First of all, what you see in a financial statement is what happened in the past. If a company reports that they have $3 billion cash on hand as of 31st December 2018, it doesn't mean that they would still have a similar amount on 1st of January 2019. One way to combat this disadvantage is to require continuous disclosure. They need to file reports at least every six months, and if there is anything material to the shareholders, they will need to make an announcement on the event date. Second, because accounting is really just a set of rules. It is not at all surprising that there are different accounting standards globally. For example, GAAP is used in US and pretty much the rest of the world, including Australia, adopts IFRS, IFRS. We will briefly cover the difference in a second. Third, a disadvantage is the potential conflict of interest. It is less obvious to see how financial statements can lead to conflicts of interest between shareholders and lenders. For example, if a company chooses to borrow money from a private creditor, such as banks, for example, the company would need to provide additional proprietary information that is typically not available in financial statements that are available to shareholders. Previous literature shows that the decision process on whether to choose private credit typically influences the company's choice on how conservative their accounting reporting is. Financial statements can also emphasize conflicts of interest between management and shareholders. As the simplest example, management need to report their remuneration in the annual reports. Not every shareholder is happy to find out their CEO gets paid $400 million in a year that sees the biggest loss in your profit in history. Generally accepted accounting principles, or GAAP, is one that mentioned in Warren Buffett's letter to shareholders in 2017 and 2018. It is set by Financial Accounting Standards Board to provide a common set of rules and a standard format for public companies' reports. Corporations are required to hire an auditor to check the annual financial statements, ensure they are prepared according to GAAP, provide evidence that the information is reliable. The other standard is the International Financial Reporting Standards, or IFRS, IFRS is set by International Accounting Standards Board, IRSB, established in 2001 by representatives from 10 countries including Australia. Since 2005, all public traded European Union companies are required to follow IFRS, and is, you can say it's accepted by all major share exchanges around the world except probably, probably the only US and Japan. So as you can see, if you are an Australian investor and is familiar with all accounting rules here, it doesn't necessarily mean you can perfectly transfer your expertise to analyzing companies listed on, say, US exchanges. If you want to find out more about differences between GAAP and IFRS, please feel free to Google them. I provide a quick comparison between the two. GAAP is rules-based and IFRS is principle-based. A rule-based system has little room for exceptions or interpretation whereas a principles-based system has potential for, difference, for different interpretations of the same tax-related situation. And if you're keen to find out more, feel free to put, post a question on discussion forum. And before we begin here, I want to point out that I have no intention in testing your ability to put together any of these financial statements balance sheet, income statement, or statement of cash flows, it is more important to know how to gather the necessary information from various statements to help you complete your capital budgeting problem or equity evaluation. We now cover the first of three financial statements, namely balance sheet. Balance sheet in its simplest form has three components, assets, liabilities, and shareholders' equity. 
the total assets should always be the sum of the total liabilities and the total shareholders' equity. If this formula is not balanced, there is something wrong with your balance sheet. We can start with an example of a balance sheet, which is your Table 2.1 from the textbook. It is important to point out that a balance sheet tells you what a company has at one point in time. That is, over here, it tells you it's as at 31st of December in 2017 and 2016, respectively. In the asset section on the left hand side, typically you have cash, accounts receivable, and inventories under the current asset. The term current here means it's less than 12 months, so less than one full reporting period. So accounts receivable here is the money that you can get the cash back from your customers, say, within a year. Let's say if you used your credit card this morning to buy a coffee from business school. Then from the cafe's perspective, your payment will be an account receivable because they haven't received cash from you and they are waiting to finalize the payment from the bank that issued your credit card. Long-term assets, also known as non-current assets, are ones that have a life longer than 12 months. If you own a building with 10 years of usable life, it is categorized as a long-term asset. On the right-hand side, you have current liabilities and long-term liabilities, which are differentiated by the time duration in a similar fashion. In the bottom, you can see that the total asset in 2017 is $170.1 million, which is the same as the sum of the two liabilities and equity. So balance sheet. Balance sheet is a snapshot in time of the firm's financial position, also called Statement of Financial Position. And here's the key formula that we just talked about, assets equal to, equals to liabilities plus shareholders' equity. So asset is what a company owns, controls, and anything that really has value. Liability is what the company owes, anything that costs the company money. And shareholders' equity is the difference between the two, assets minus liabilities. So here are some more breakdown of what can be included in the balance sheet. So current here means current less than one year, 12 months. Non-current means more than one year. I want you to pay attention to the term over here be below net property plan and equipment. We have a few new terms, depreciation, accumulated depreciation, book value. We will discuss this term shortly. And here is the first slide that has an orange heading. Remember that slides with orange heading contains important concepts that will come back and be applied again in the rest of the unit. Networking capital, NWC, is the capital available in the short term to run a business. It is equal to current asset minus current liabilities, which is asset with less than 12 months of life minus liabilities within 12 months. Firms with low or negative networking capital may face a shortage of funds unless they can generate sufficient cash from their ongoing activities. We will use annual changes in NWC to estimate free cash flows in capital budgeting in Chapter 9. So we'll definitely come back to this terminology again in Week 9. Now, the term depreciation from the non-current asset section a few slides ago. This is a very important slide, so please make sure that you revisit this slide whenever you have doubt. Depreciation is a yearly deduction that a firm makes from the value of its non-current asset other than land over time according to a depreciation schedule that depends on an asset's lifespan. It is not an actual cash expense, but represents an estimate of the cost that arise from wear and tear of the firm's asset. To make your life easier, here I point out where you could expect to see depreciation can have impact in each statement. In the balance sheet, the book value of an asset is equal to its acquisition cost less accumulated depreciation. In the income statement, depreciation is treated as an, as an operating expense. 
In a statement of cash flows, depreciation is added back to net income to estimate the total cash from operating activities. We will use depreciation to estimate free cash flows in capital budgeting in Chapter 9. I have a video for you to explain what depreciation is from Investopedia. Unfortunately, I'm not sure whether this lecture recording can record any sound from, from my Mac, so please feel free to check the link in Prezi lecture slides or just Google depreciation and Investopedia. Another important aspect of the balance sheet is to tell you shareholders' book value of equity, which is the difference between assets and liabilities. Recall that earlier in the recording, we mentioned that Warren Buffett no longer includes the book value of equity per share in his letter to shareholders. It doesn't mean his company no longer reports that in the balance sheet. It is just that he chooses not to report that figure or have any emphasis on the book value of equity in his letter to shareholders as a medium to describe his performance in the past year. An important related concept to book value of equity is the market value of equity, which is equal to the market price per share times the number of shares outstanding. This definition suggests that the market value typically applies to listed companies only. Unlike book, of, book value of equity, market value cannot be negative. So over here, book value of equity equals to asset minus liabilities. You could have more liabilities than asset. So which means the book value of equity can be negative, but market value of equity cannot be negative because you can't have a negative share price, nor you can have a negative number of shares outstanding. The market value often differs substantially from book value because the market value depends on expectations of future risk and return. Why is that the case? Think about the market price per share. When an investor is making up her mind whether to invest a company's share, she cares about what this company can bring back to her in the future. That is, future growth opportunity. So the price she's willing to pay for will be a way to express her expectations of future risk and return of the company. And book value of equity is sometimes used to estimate liquidation value. We can learn a great deal from a firm's balance sheet to, ex to assess the firm's value, example market to book ratio, its leverage, and its short-term cash needs. We'll talk about some of these ratios shortly. We're going to start with market to book ratio. You see, this one is another orange heading slide, which means it's very important, something that we'll come back again. Market to book ratio is a very important ratio as a ratio which is, can be estimated as the market value of equity divided by book value of equity. If a company has a low market to book ratio, it is typically known as value stocks. So lower market to book ratios is equivalent of saying higher book to market if you just flip the order. On the other hand, a firm that has higher market to book ratio, it is typically known as growth stocks. It is easier to understand why a company can be called a growth stock if it has a higher market to book ratio. Remember that the market value represents the market's perspective on future growth opportunity of the company. Relatively speaking, the higher the market to book ratio, the higher growth opportunity is embedded in their share price. There is no straight cutoff to determine what's low and what's high. Typically, you need to compare it with other companies in the same industry and compare the changes in this ratio with the company's past record. The textbook here gives you some statistics on average market to book ratios across different sectors in Australia. So it is important to remember that some sectors have higher market to book ratios, such as when you compare utilities with, say, the one right next to it, te telecommunication services. But that doesn't mean all companies in utilities have much higher growth opportunities than ones in these sectors. Okay, now let's get your pen and paper out to try our first problem. So problem one, Ryland Enterprises has, a f has 5 million shares outstanding. The market price per share is $22. The firm's book value of equity is 
50 million dollars. What is Ryland's market capitalization? How does the market capitalization compare to Ryland's book value of equity? And what is the market to book ratio? Please pause this video so you can have a go. The market capitalization is eleven hundred is a one hundred and ten million dollars. Well, is how to get that? Well, it's five million shares times twenty two shares, twenty two dollars per share, which gives you one hundred and ten. So over here, you can you can observe that the market capitalization, which sometimes we just simply say market cap, is sim is significantly higher than Ryland's book value of equity of fifty million dollars. So to get the market to book ratio is 110 divided by 50 which is 2.2 here here's another common ratio that you can estimate from balance sheet that to equity ratio which is a common ratio used to access a firm's leverage is a ratio of total debt over equity Enterprise value. Note that this one has an orange heading, which means you will come back again in this unit in the future weeks. So enterprise value, known as the total enterprise value, assesses the value of the underlying business asset. Um, so here's a simple formula. EV equals to market value of equity plus debt minus cash. Different textbooks have different definitions for what should be included in the debt, this component over here. But the more important part is to understand why EV is a sum of these two and subtract the cash holding of a company. Imagine you're buying a company with a market cap of say $100 million, $10 million loans outstanding and $20 million cash. Your goal is to buy the entire company, so you will need to buy all shares from existing shareholders, which is $100 million. Once you have the company, you will need to pay back its creditors, so you will need to prepare for another $10 million to pay back loans. But once you own a company, its $20 million cash becomes yours. So when you try to estimate the enterprise value, you need to subtract the cash amount because once you acquire the company, your cash is yours and so that should reduce the amount of money you need to prepare to buy this company. Of course. This EV figure doesn't exactly tell you how much a company is worth. Because if people learn about your intention of purchasing this company, they will be bidding activities to buy the shares ahead of you and then hoping to sell them to you at a much higher price. Alright, this is the weekly game trivia. The question is, why is the first Tuesday of each month, except January, an important day for the Australian market? The lecture recording is done on Monday, um, so hopefully you are watching this on Tuesday, So, which means Tuesday happened to be today, Tuesday, or the day that you are watching, happened to be the first Tuesday of March. So why is that important day for Australian market? Um, I don't have any present for you today, if you could answer the question, but you should be proud of yourself if you just try to Google the answer. We'll have a short discussion next Monday. We have introduced balance sheet, now moves on to the next one, income statement. Here we have a typical income statement. As the name suggests, an income statement should give you an idea of the income earned by the company. Reading from top to bottom, you almost always start with the total sales, or sometimes called revenue here, unlike a balance sheet that tells you what you have as at a point in time. An income statement gives you a breakdown of the profitability over the reporting period. So here is a reporting period between 2016 and 2017 for the year ended 31st of December. And to get gross profit, so starting from the top, to get gross profit, you subtract the cost of sales from total sales. To get operating profit, you further subtract gross profit from three items, selling general and administrative expenses, Research and development, R and D, depreciation, depreciation, and amortization. Um, so you have operating profit over here. It's ten point four million dollars for twenty seventeen. Unless you have other income, 
the operating profit is the same as earnings become earnings before income and tax EBIT. If the company has outstanding loans and has made interest to its creditors, this expenditure actually subtracts the tax payable to tax office. You then get net profits before tax and net profit after tax. In the bottom, we have two important ratios, EPS and diluted EPS. EPS is known as earnings per share and calculated by net profit after tax divided by number of shares outstanding. Diluted EPS is a net profit after tax divided by number of current outstanding shares plus additional convertible shares. Just bear in mind that this is not an accounting unit that you are supposed to put together an income statement. You should focus on which profit figure is more relevant to you in various scenarios. The income statement shows the flow of revenues and expenses generated by the firm over a period of time. Sometimes it's called the profit and loss statement, PL statement. It is not necessarily a guide to future flow, future cash flows, or future profitability. It is important to compare it with companies' previous year's figures. So analyzing the trend across time is a basic skill here. The last or bottom line of the income statement shows net profit which is a measure of its profitability during the period, also referred to as the firm's earnings. One of the more relevant aspects to what we do in this unit is the depreciation amount over here, which is a deduction to your profit. Although depreciation is not a cash transaction, it can be used as a tax shield to reduce tax liability. We'll cover more about this in week 9, Capital Budgeting. We just we, pre, um, we briefly described what EPS is, let me read that again. So from the income statement, if we obtain a net income, which represents the total earnings of the firm's equity holders, to compare between different companies, of course, companies have different sizes, they, some company may have $10 million net income, some company may have $110 million in net income, which is a lot bigger. So how would you compare them? One simple way to do it is to standardize it by shares outstanding, which is here using net income divided by shares outstanding, EPS. Um, there's, a, there's, a re, there's a related concept called diluted EPS. Um, we're not going to cover too much about this in this unit. If you're keen to find out what you mean by convertible bonds, uh, I'm more than happy to, to explain it on a discussion forum. And EPS is the one that we care a bit more. Two other important ratios that can be estimated using profits and loss from income statement is the ROE and RA. Investment returns, return on equity, used to evaluate the firm's return on investment by comparing its net profit to its investment. So it is calculated as net profit divided by book value of equity, ROE, return on equity, divided by, so net profit divided by book value of equity. The other one is RA, so it's net profit over total asset. And one more extremely popular valuation ratio is known as price earnings ratio. Analysts and investors use a number of ratios to gauge, but here the PE ratio is probably the mo most important one. It's used to assess whether a share is over or undervalued based on the idea that the value of a share should be proportional to the earnings it can generate. So what does a high PE ratio imply? That tells you for every dollar that a company earns as a profit, the higher the PE ratio, the more money an investor would like to pay for this company's share. It may not make sense just yet, but think about share price represents investors' expectation on future growth opportunity. A high PE ratio implies that a company may not yet have the profitability that matches with its share price, but investors believe this will happen in the future. This slide has a rather fancy way of expressing return on equity, which is the net profit over book value of equity. This clever transformation is known as DuPont identity, which illustrates an ROE figure can be interpreted as a product of three other figures. It also shows you that 
Although the math in accounting is not all that difficult, because it's just one divided by the others, but it can be confusing to outsiders. We won't spend too much time on DuPont identity in this unit, but it's good that you know how this is trans transformed from net profit over total equity to these final figures, product of three. Now let's get your pen and paper out again for the second problem. This problem can be confusing to many, many people. The purpose of giving this example lies in the discussion for part C. Please pause this video to at least have it give it a go. If AHP develops the product in-house, its earnings would fall by $500 times 1 minus 35%, which is $325 million. So with no change to the to number of shares outstanding, its EPS would decrease by $0.05, cent, which is $325 million divided by 6,500 million shares outstanding, which with the final EPS figure, $0.75. Cent. So how does that work? I mean, not everyone will understand what I mean by 500 times 1 minus 35%. Let me borrow this income statement figure and put some numbers here. So in this case, there's no change in total sales. So I put down zero there, zero here and zero here. There's a decrease in R&D by 500. So I put down minus 500 here and keep reading. You can see that, well, that's 500 minus 500, minus 500, and times tax. So remember, we have negative profit, and negative profit would generate a tax rebate. So over here, you can see that, that the tax liability is in fact a negative 175, which means you get back 175, um, assuming the company is, is overall in a tax paying position. So your net profit after tax is minus 325 over here. Oh, move over here. If you're not sure, re rewind the video and read again. Oops. So for part B, if the AHP acquires the technology for $900 million worth of its stock, you will need to issue $900 divided by $18 per share which equals to 50 million new shares. Since earnings without this transaction are 0 0.8 times 6.5 6 billion, which is $5.2 billion earnings, its EPS with a purchase is 5.2 earnings divided by 6,500 plus extra 50 million new shares. So over here, it, everything expressed in billions, that's why it's 6.55 billion rather than 6,500 million and the EPS will be 0 0.794. Here we assume the company can issue additional shares at a current price, which is not a trivial assumption. Parsi asks which method of acquiring the methodology of acquiring the technology has a smaller impact on earnings. Is that method cheaper? Well, acquiring the technology would have a smaller impact on earnings because the earnings only go down to 0 0.794 to, from 0 0.8 comparing to 0 0.75 from 0 0.8. But this method is not cheaper. Developing an in-house is less costly and provides an immediate tax benefit. The earnings impact is not a good measure of the expense. In addition, note that because acquisition permanently increases the number of shares outstanding, it will reduce AHP's earnings per share in future years as well. So what's the purpose of having this example? It tells you that, well, if you're trying to say measures a manager, the manager, the financial manager's performance or CEO's performance by EPS, by whether they can maintain the, the company's earnings per share as a profitability ratio, then very likely you would encourage them to do this, even though that one has a much higher cost and a more permanent impact to a company's future profitability. By the way, 
Reading all these accounting statements can be a great fun. Here's a good example by Schlitt and Perla. If you need motivation to master your accounting units, this is a really good read. Uh, I'm not at all to endorse the Kindle version or hard copy version. I mean, there was third edition, second edition. The one I read was third edition and I paid about $10 for it. I'm perfectly happy for it. Um, so generally it's a good fun. It's a fun to read. All right, now we go to the third statement, which is the statement of cash flows. Again, we start with an example of statement of cash flows. It has three components, a section for operating cash from operating activities, cash from investing activities, and cash from financing activities. You may wonder why we need why we would need a separate statement for just cash flows. Remember, cash is the most liquid form of asset. And you probably have learned about have heard about a term called cash is the king. It is extremely important to understand the cash position of a company. So net income from income statement typically does not equal the amount of cash the firm has earned. We have non-cash expenses such as depreciation and amortization and uses of cash not included on the income statement. For example, you have investment in property, plant and equipment. The firm statement of cash flow uses the information from the income statement and balance sheet to determine how much cash the firm has generated, how that cash has been allocated during a set period. Cash is important, we just talk about it, because it's needed to pay bills and maintain operation and is the source of any return of invest of investments for invest of investment for investors. As we mentioned before, there are three sections, operating activity, which is generally income statement items, investing activities, which generally are balance sheet items and buying and selling of non-current asset, financing activities, which generally are balance sheet items again, it includes movements in non-current liabilities and equity. So here I help you to point out that where you see the depreciation again. In income statement, we mentioned that depreciation is used to reduce your tax liability as an expense. However, it is not a cash expense. So when you want to find out how much cash you have, you need to add back depreciation to your net profit to work out your actual cash balance. This will be examined again in week nine capital budgeting. Return earnings. This is a very important figure to help you in pricing equities in week seven. So what is return earnings? Is firm's return earnings for the year is the difference between a firm's net income from income statement and a statement of cash flows and the amount it spends on dividends, which is from the statement of cash flows. So return earnings equals to net income minus dividends. Um, so you will come back to this um, term again in week seven when you try to price equities. For now, please understand how it is estimated from which statement. Okay, the last section is on financial ratios. In fact, this is a self-study section. I'm not the biggest fan of many of these ratios, but it's important to understand how they are constructed, what information do they contain, and what information do they omit if investors simply focus on certain ratios. Here are some examples of profitability ratios, liquidity ratios, working capital ratios, interest coverage ratios, leverage ratios, valuation ratios, operating returns, and more and so on and so on. So here let's talk about some, some, of, some of these important ones. First of all, the profitability ratios, net profit margin. Net profit margin represent the fraction of each dollar in revenues that is available to equity holders after the firm pays interest and taxes. Net income divided by total sales. Leverage ratio, debt over equity. Valuation ratios, PE ratios, when I mentioned it before, and operating returns, RA, return on asset. So here, 
The RA includes interest expense in the numerator because the asset in the denominator have been funded by both debt and equity investors. RA. Here's an example report from Macquarie Private House. On the left hand side, under investment fundamentals, you can see a whole bunch of ratios that investors expect to see in any typical report. And there are a number of interpretative issues. For example, when comparing ratios, be very certain that they have been calculated using the same definitions or classifications. For example, using ending value versus ones that are using average of two time points. And ratios only take on meaning when compared to some norm or standard. One of the most important steps in ratio analysis is choosing acceptable benchmark. And ratio analysis does not provide answers, it simply provokes questions. The answers still need to be found for those questions. So for example, if you have a bad ratio, some company has a really, really high uh, market to book ratio. So a bad ratio here is more informative than a normal ratio. Well, that's pretty much it, everyone. So remember, this, the last section is a self-study section. And um, please read. But I won't be asking you, well, as far as I understand, I won't be asking you any of these new ratios that you have never dealt with before. Or, and remember that you can bring in your own information sheet to exam. So you can pretty much put everything on it or anything really you like on it. So please make sure you have a go at these tutorial questions. Um, see you next Monday in West Farmers Lecture Theater, either at 10 o'clock in the morning or 3 p.m. in the afternoon.